Nice to see everybody on this beautiful day. Thank you for making the choice to come here and spend it with me. We're in the midst of our test three. Uh, Kyle started us off on test four material on Monday, and I'm picking up where he left off. And I always try to check in when I have the substitute to give them feedback. I've heard a couple things, but I just uh, give you one of three choices and make a quick count. Worse than average for any instructor that you've had in college, about average for any instructor you've had in college, or above average for any person you've had in college as an instructor. So everybody, and you can vote as you will. Above average, raise your hand. So hold them up there. Get over here. Cool. Uh, I gotta write it down. <laughs> Average. Raise them up. Where I can see them. I start on this side. Y'all good? Okay. And below average, which is fine to say. No? That's pretty good. That's really good. That's awesome. Glad to hear it. So he'll be with you on Monday again because I've got jury duty. And you don't get to tell the state when you do and don't have jury duty. I've looked at all the exclusionary criteria and I don't meet any of them. So me having class doesn't make a damn to them, which is fine. I like to do my civic duty. But I know they won't use me anyway because I'm a psychologist and every time you tell them that, they say, oh, thank you for your time. They may do that on Monday, they may do that on Tuesday, they may do it on Wednesday. But interestingly enough, we know a lot of stuff that lawyers don't necessarily want you to know on the jury. So they tend to just have us not on the jury. Which is fine, I understand that. It would be nice if they could just tell me that earlier and say, well, y'all go teach a class because we ain't going to use you anyway. But that's all right. So y'all talked about Karen Horney? No. Nope. Y'all talked about defense mechanisms? We've just yeah. started Karen. Just started. Just flipped to the page. Excellent. Excellent. That's perfect. Thank you very much for that. So you talked about Carl Jung, and we'll talk a little bit more about introversion and extroversion. And what you'll notice, and you know, I got a, a little video I'll use on Friday just because it's kind of fun to see. It looks like everybody's arguing. You got all these competing theories. If you take a personality class, in other words, an actual upper level psych class on personality, you can take a semester's long course and find out nobody's got it nailed down. You look at all those theorists we saw with intelligence, and people like to think, well, I know what intelligence is. Well, from a layperson's perspective, you may know what you think intelligence is, but when you get into the scientific side of things, it's debatable and empirically debatable. And of course, that's the kind of debate we want to be having is what holds up to scrutiny? And Freud had a wealth of information. We take it with a big grain of salt because a lot of it was not operationalizable. You couldn't actually put it into terms or variables that could be measured such that it could be refuted or supported. Some of the stuff that he contributed still is with us today because it does have empirical support and it stood the test of time. But back in his day, he was one of the first people to even start to posit a full comprehensive theory of how people come to be an identity. Who are you? How do other people know you? How do they describe you? What happens inside of yourself as you go through the development process that you come to a point where you have a self-image, a self-view, a concept of you as a discrete and unique person compared to all the other discrete and unique persons in our race, the human race, right? There's so many of us and we share so much genetically in terms of how we live as biological entities, but on the other side, Every one of us is really unique in some way. And so that being possibly who you are as a personality, he started to theorize, but not everybody agreed with him. He was relatively controversial. I wouldn't even say relatively. He was extremely controversial. And people started to do research to either refute him or support him. And you see that certain people who aligned with him, modified his views. He didn't care for that. He didn't like Carl Jung modifying his views. He stopped all professional interaction with Carl Jung. Called him his crown prince successor, if that gives you any hint as to Freud's view of himself. Who names their own crown prince successor, right? 
but after he kind of deviated on some key concepts, it wouldn't have anything to do with him. But you look at his theory and you say, well, gosh, that's really misogynistic. It's very unfavorable to women, and it's patriarchal, and it's a little oppressive at the very least, and very oppressive at the very most. It certainly was geared to find what he assumed was the case that men had superiority and women were inferior to men and that was just the way it was and that was about penis envy that women saw that men had this appendage that they lacked and they wished they had it and you go through the Oedipus complex and the Electra complex and you resolve all of these things and then you find yourself socializing into roles through sublimation and other people came along and challenged those notions and one being a psychoanalytic female and what is probably the most ironic of all pronunciations, Karen Horney is how I'm told it's pronounced. It looks like horny to me, and a lot of his stuff was based on sexuality. Not the kind of sexuality that most people think about when they're thinking tabloid magazines. Talk about reproduction of the species and drives internal to ourselves that are so primitive and base and animalistic that we don't even like to acknowledge that they exist. And so we deny that they exist. We repress them and we push them down into the unconscious, but he says they're still there and they still move us every day and everything we do, we're just not aware of it. So for him, it's a deterministic world. You go through your childhood, you get your experiences would load you up on various kinds of fixations and compulsions and issues and neuroses, and then you're fixed that way. If you remember we talked about uh, Adler looking at the, the uh, or excuse me, Erickson, Eric Erickson's stages of development where he took the first five and they mapped onto the ones Kyle told you about the other day. Freud's five psychosexual stages of development. But he said you don't stop developing in your late teens, you keep developing throughout life. That's where Erickson modified Freud. Anna Freud, his daughter modified Freud and came up with child psychoanalysis. And Karen Horney was a psychoanalytic therapist and researcher and theorist. And she didn't throw all of Freud out. She in fact thought Freud was onto something and wanted to amend it. And one of the, I guess, most classic things that she did was when she was looking at Freudian psychoanalysis and this thing of penis envy and this idea of male dominance being kind of culturally ordained because it was somehow the natural order of things, she flipped it on its head. She said, women don't want penises. They don't have an issue where they think that they're missing and they got gypped on the appendage, right? What happens with male dominance and male uh, patriarchy is that women have power. They have the power of life. They have the womb. You don't need a man but for a second to create a life, but you need a woman to bring it to term and raise it up. And she said, that's the real power. What's the ultimate power in this world? Creation of another life. And women had the primary ability and responsibility to do it, and men being jealous of their power then subjugated them physically and socially and politically and emotionally. And she said, yeah, penis envy, ha. Y'all got womb envy and you're just rationalizing. If you remember that defense mechanism of rationalization, you're taking the way it is and rationalizing it so that women are subserving it to men. But what in fact is the case here is y'all are jealous of women, so you use your power to then control them indirectly. So you control the womb indirectly. Interestingly enough, not coming down one way or the other for you. You pick where you want to on anything. But when you look at reproductive laws and reproductive women's health issues, who's usually talking the loudest about them? Men. They don't have a womb. But they got a lot to say about it. And they used to control every aspect of females in society. That's breaking down as would be predicted by Karen Horney's idea that once you start realizing that it's not all about guys, uh, it's about people and understanding how she functioned to stay a psychoanalytic theorist but yet revise pretty profoundly Freud's views, you see that they're amenable to change. They're, in other words, open to question. And if you question them, and you start looking at some of the other researchers, many of whom were women psychologists and psychologists of color, who started challenging all of these dominant stereotypes with data, the stereotypes don't hold up. So we look and move 
past the psychoanalytics, now we're looking into the behavioral area. We could talk about B.F. Skinner, but for the behaviorist, your personality is really just the sum total of all of your learning experiences. All of your reinforcement experiences, all of your punishment experiences, accrue over a lifetime such that you become pretty predictable. Right? Isn't that what personality is? It's some degree of predictability. Think about describing your friend, your best friend to somebody else, and you'll start clicking off characteristics, right? Things that you would say are pretty stable about them. Well, they're friendly, they're honest, they're nice and carry. What do you pick it? You're going to describe it because it doesn't fluctuate. It doesn't change. And Freud would say, well, that happened from early childhood experiences to set your personality in stone, more or less. Maybe you can modify it a little bit, but everybody will be neurotic. He didn't hold out a whole lot of hope for change. But for the behaviorist, you get the same outcome. You get who you have as an adult, but for a different reason. Not because of a failure to resolve some psychosexual stage of development, because they didn't really believe in any of that. Right? They believed in behavior. You would just have a punishment experience, a reinforcement experience, all day, every day, your entire life, until you amalgamated into the kind of person who tended to like this thing or tended not to like that thing, tended to do this thing, tended not to do that thing. But being so far removed from every single individual experience, you just wouldn't remember all of that, and you would think you had free will and that you were making choices of your own. But to them, you weren't. It was a deterministic set, just like Freud. You think you have free will because you're a rationalizing, thinking human being, but if we look back in both cases, what they would say is your history on this planet, right, stamped you into being the kind of person you are. And you don't have as much control as you think you have. In fact, they would have said you have very little control over yourself. We could predict you one way or the other. Problem with one is that you couldn't predict hardly anything. You take a Freudian situation, or you take a situation, I can give you an excellent Freudian explanation of how that came to be. But I would be hard-pressed to then predict what the person would do. Behaviorism, if a person tends to do this over and over and over again, I can use that as prediction for what they might do later. But it doesn't go deep. And then we get the humanists, and, and we'll get to them in a minute. They go deep. But we get a shift from pure behaviorism to Albert Bandura's social learning theory, where he incorporates concepts within behaviorism. As I would advocate, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Don't throw away all of Freud, see what holds up. Don't throw away all the behaviorism, see what holds up. And what held up was that learning occurs, surely it does, and it occurs in a social context. Cognitive is the way you think and behavior is what you do. And so from Bandura's point of view, our overall goal as human beings is to develop socially appropriate relationships. That we define ourselves as social animals and that we have self concepts, but that we relate them to one another. So I define myself certainly as an individual, but I have all these relationships that help define me as well. And moving through life, it starts out with parents and siblings and peers and neighbors and things like that, and then it goes on to be co-workers and people you choose to have friendships with, etc., etc. Nobody's a pure hermit. Very, 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 very few people. You look at uh, Walden, right? Thoreau, writing, goes off to be a hermit. And then what does he do? A couple of years of that, he goes back to town, writes a book, and sells it to people, right? Social relationships. Being a hermit, it's not fun. You've got to have some kind of connection with other people. But looking at your tests and what you want to know is this concept that Bandura contributed. Now we're going internal. Now we're doing what the behaviors wouldn't do. We're defining internal constructs, but not in these nebulous terms that the psychoanalytics contributed, right, that really you couldn't evaluate all that well. You know, measure an Oedipus complex for me, right? Measure an electric complex, right? That's a hard thing to do, but self-efficacy is a fairly straightforward concept, which is that you have the ability to do something. So self-efficacy is your belief about whether you are or are not able to do a specific kind of thing. Now, you might have a general self-efficacy of, I'm, I'm a pretty effective person, I'm pretty adaptive, or man, life seems to hit me all the time and I don't do very well. You could have a low self-efficacy generally, or a high self-efficacy generally, but you've got this belief structure about what you can and can't do, and as I like to quote Henry Ford, whether you believe you can or you believe you can't, you're right, because when we get into social psychology, you'll see that we create self-fulfilling prophecies. So the idea here is that you have a set of beliefs about specific abilities to be effective or not effective. So if you want a mnemonic, 
Self-effectiveness. What's your belief about your effectiveness, right? And whether you can produce positive outcomes, they tend to be stable over time. I have a very low basketball self-efficacy. I can dribble a ball, I can shoot it into the air, but I'm not going to play pro because I'm not that good at it. I know that I could practice a lot every day and become better and better, but I don't believe that I'm ever going to attain pro status at that particular activity. I can look at guitar and say, well, I'm a good mediocre guitar player and I'm fine with that. In other words, it's not bad or good to have high or low, but it does predict what I'm going to do. If I think mediocre is what I am, I'm not likely to try to work really, really hard to get better. If I believe I have the ability to do something though, then I'm going to work hard and persist through obstacles. My example here will be math. A lot of people believe, oh, I'm just not a math person. I can't do math. Well, that's what I believe for the longest time. I still believe there's some truth to that, but I can trace it back to Mrs. Cusack in second grade. What happened in second grade to change my own self-efficacy, my own perception of my own ability to do mathematics? They had this weird little thing where they split up kids into different groups. Mrs. Lamb did reading, Mrs. Cusack did math. I went into Mrs. Lamb's class and read, and there were books in my house. That was helpful. I had resources to use. I had some parents that liked reading, and, but nobody really checked my homework. Nobody kept me nose to the grindstone on doing work, especially in elementary school. And I go into Mrs. Lamb's class. She's like, oh, you read so well. And she gives me all this praise and all these good feelings, right? From a, from a Skinner standpoint, I'm getting reinforced tremendously for reading, right? Lots of positive feedback from me to read, which makes me more likely to read and become better at it. Believing that I'm good at it, even if I encounter difficult words or difficult passages or difficult topics, I might persevere through that. But Mrs. Cusack had a different take on it, and the way that she did it was this. She came in in a fairly punitive manner. Now, nobody checking my homework, that happens. But I was doing my homework as a second grader, and I didn't line up things, I didn't write very well, I had my columns misaligned and all that, and my, my paper would get dog-eared and crumpled up, but I did it, and I'd bring it into class, and I remember this, even many these flashbulb memories we talked about, right? And she would snatch my paper up and hold it in front of her and go, this class is how you don't do math. This chicken scratch and crumbled up paper, this is, not, this is not the way you do mathematics. And she held me up as an example of how somebody is no good at math. And pretty soon I learned what? I'm no good at math. And I stopped trying. I stopped trying until I got into 12th grade. I had used my intelligence to avoid mathematics. I cheated my way through some stuff, I intimidated my way through other stuff, and I just didn't show up to other things. But given the choice of dropping out and moving out, which was the choice I was given when I decided I was going to drop out, my mom said, nah, you can move out if you drop out. I'm like, ah, I guess I'll persist to the end because I work at a car wash and it's hard to pay rent with car wash money. And I knew that much and I stayed in, but I needed a math credit and they put me in remedial math. Remedial math in 12th grade was doing three-digit multiplication. Three-digit multiplication, but I didn't know the times tables well. I could kind of do them, giving me enough time. I could do three-digit multiplication. It was what we learned in third and fourth grade, which is about when I stopped learning mathematics. So I excelled there. I had people cheating off of me in that class, which was fascinating to me because they really couldn't do three-digit multiplication. My guess is they had similar experiences that were very punishing and told them they were incapable of doing this work. So time goes by, I go to community college, what am I most afraid of? Math classes. Man, you give me something to read, I'll read it all day and give it back to you in as many words as you care to hear it in because I'm a verbal person. But math scared me and I ran into a class where a woman just confronted the whole class and said, everybody comes in here and says, I can't do math. That's poppycock. I was like, wow, poppycock. I'm pretty sure I can't do it. But she said it this way. Everybody can do math. Everybody can do it because it's nothing but a game. It's just sets of rules. If you know the rules, you can play the game. But there's lots of rules, so you have to do it every single day. Every single day you have to play with these rules. And you can play the game. If you do what I say and work on it every day, you can succeed in math. And I just had that epiphany of like, here I am, a grown adult in my middle 20s, a woman telling me I could do it if I did exactly what she says. She doesn't know me from anybody, and I did what she said, and I made an A. 
which led me to question how valid was this belief I had, right? Because what I had been doing was believing I was incapable of doing it. Therefore, I didn't try very hard. I certainly didn't study every day. I then failed tests and went, see, can't do it. But given that challenge as an adult and somebody who encouraged me, I said, you know what? Let's put it to the real test. She was right. Then I went into algebra to do baby math one and baby math two. That's what I call pre and pre, right? That's what we call developmental courses now. I had to do both of those. And then I went to college algebra and I took two college algebra classes. It was on a quarter system five days a week. Took them from two different teachers, audited one, took a grade in the other. I was in class two times a day in algebra and I did a homework for both classes, took the test for both classes, and I made an A. That was not easy. But I had a lot to overcome because I did not have a foundation to do well in math. Not because I was incapable of doing math, but because I had never developed the foundation to do it since second and third and fourth grade. So belief matters. If you see what I'm saying, this is a personality construct that I challenged in my mid-twenties. I'm still not excellent at math. I still don't know my times tables well. But I know them better than I did then. And I have software that does my math for me now. So self-efficacy, let's see if it matters. Here's the study. Look at quitting smoking. This is a thing that doesn't happen often in the real world because you can't possibly pull this off. Social psych experiments are really interesting. What they did in this case, they bring people in who are interested in quitting smoking. Quitting smoking is really, really hard. Really hard. About 5% of people can pull it off on their own the first time without any assistance whatsoever. About 90 plus percent can't do it the first time. So if you've been in that scenario, your parents or your friends have been in that scenario, that's normal. Here they took people in and gave a bunch of bogus tests, randomly assigning them to groups. We had the people who didn't get any treatment whatsoever. We had the other group which got treatment which might be set a quit date, think about how you'd cut down, you know, you give them some tools to help them go through the process of quitting. But in this group, they told them that the results of the test showed that they'd be extremely good at quitting. The tests show that you are gonna have a much better than average chance of quitting because you've got all kinds of personality characteristics that show us you'll be successful. They lied to them. And guess what that lie did? It became truth, right? The lie became the truth. You don't see, you don't see 60% quit rates anywhere under any program. But you don't lie to people at real programs, do you? Where could you pull this kind of thing off at? You could pull it off maybe in a university where you have an IRB approved study where you can give false feedback to people and at the end of it you have to tell them the truth anyway. Right? But here we even have a much, you know, about 5%. That's what you would expect. Right? People just don't have that success on their own because frequently they don't believe they can quit. I don't know. When the stress hits, I just can't do it. I don't know if I can do it. What if I get all jittery? What if I get all this? And, and they talk themselves out of their own inner strengths. You don't have 100% success because it's still a tough thing to do even if you believe the lie. My guess is some people didn't believe the lie even when told it by what seemed to be credible people. But here it is. Att attempt, attempts to quit smoking. Quitters. Looking at baseline, where's their self-efficacy level on quitting? Remember, self-efficacy is not about how you feel about yourself. It depends on what your belief is about a particular thing, whether it's basketball or math or verbal skills or social skills or smoking. The people who were most successful at quitting were the ones who believed they were most capable of quitting. And at the end, the people who continue to be smokers actually lowered their belief in their ability to quit from when they started out. And the people who relapsed but maybe want to try again also lowered. But the people who succeeded did what? Confirmed their belief. It was probably equally difficult for these people to quit. But because these people believed they could quit, they persevered through the obstacles until they succeeded, which then became self-confirming that they were good at that particular aspect of their life. So now we talk about humanism more broadly as we move and to some other theorists of personality. <laughs> Humanism itself is this really broad concept that was a reaction against. A reaction against psychoanalysis and a reaction against behaviorism. Because both of those schools of thought really have a fairly pessimistic view about people, right? 
Ah, you know, you're born into one circumstance or another. You go through your learning situations if you're a behaviorist, or you go through your, you know, socializing situations and parents and child relationships early on in life if you're psychoanalytic. But then you come out as an adult, and you think you have free will, but you don't really. It's kind of a pathological, pessimistic, deterministic type of philosophy about human nature. The humanism, the humanism that arose was actually a direct reaction against these and eventually became called the third force in psychology. It became so big and it's predominant today. If you've ever heard of positive psychology, it's a remnant or an actual outgrowth of humanistic psychology. The idea here is, know what? You are unique, but you do have free will. You have choice. You have ability to make changes in your life. You're not set on a deterministic path where you have no control really over what you do and you don't do. And that we need growth. And that human beings, we can look at the clinical side, what's gone wrong with human beings, but you flip it on its head and you see what goes right with human beings. For all that goes wrong, there's tons that goes right. You can look at the wars and the famine and the poverty, but you can look at the people who try to alleviate wars and famine and poverty, right? You can look at the ignorance and you can also look at us going to the moon and beyond. We do some amazing things as human beings and they thought that was underemphasized in most psychology up to the date. And that idea that you have free will and that you need growth translates into a, a model that allows you to change. You stress inner directedness. I can choose for myself and phenomenological reality. Phenomenological reality I've already been talking about a little bit. It's how you perceive reality. The photons are the photons, but whether I think they're light yellow or light green is my interpretation, right? I can look at a person and the action, and one person will say, oh, you need to have compassion for that person. Other people go, no, you need to be hard on that person. The facts being the same, people interpret reality differently. The facts are, in fact, debatable. Reality is not something that's so objective that everybody agrees on it. We actually interpret reality. We create reality through our lenses, our worldviews, our belief structures, our schemas, our scripts all guide the way we perceive the world and the perceptions we have of the world guide our actions in the world and create many of the effects we just assume would occur anyway which might not have depending on how we viewed and acted in it. So phenomenological reality is a big word but it's an important word. Your reality and my reality are different. We all agree on certain constraints in reality. We agree today is Wednesday around 1.05 p.m that it's a beautiful day outside, but some people don't think it's a beautiful day outside. They think it could be a little warmer or a little cooler. You see what I'm saying? We could all go out there and read a thermometer and say it's X degrees outside, but somebody's going to go, that's a little cool for me. Somebody else will say, that's a little hot for me. What's the reality? Well, most people see it as whatever I think is right, and you're crazy. If I say it's warm out today, then it is warm out today because that's how I perceive it. And if you go, no, nah, it's a little chilly, I'm going to say, I don't know what's wrong with you because it's warm. But it depends. It's relative to your view. Carl Rogers comes along. You want a mnemonic for Carl Rogers? I just say call him Mr. Rogers. Everybody know who Mr. Rogers is from PBS? Yeah. Yep. Mr. Rogers neighborhood. He believes in you. He doesn't even know you, but you're a unique and valuable individual and he cares about you. That's Fred Rogers but it's also Carl Rogers. They are similar on that point. They believe in you and your inherent abilities to overcome difficulties in your world and they believe you have value at the core level. So, we have a self-concept. Now that's going to be that's going to be a similar theme. You have a self-concept from a psychoanalytic point of view. You have a self-concept from a behaviorist point of view, except the behaviorists who were hardcore just didn't study your consciousness. They didn't deny you had one. They didn't deny you had thoughts. They didn't deny you had feelings. They just denied you could study them objectively. Right? So the idea that you have an opinion of yourself is a common thread through all of these theories, right? That you have some thoughts on who you are and what that means. And so your own collection of beliefs about your uniqueness and behavior. We have a self-ideal. That's very similar to Freud's superego. The superego is what causes guilt. You want to see people who haven't developed superegos? They're the ones who fill the prisons. 
Because they, what? They let their id impulses run wild. What they want when they want it. Laws be damned. People's needs be damned. And that's just a Freudian interpretation of that. I think it's a lot more nuanced than that. And that's something you can't even really put any kind of empirical yardstick on. So that's a little less useful to me. But everybody's got an idea of what they would be if they were at their best. If you were the best student you could be, you have a sense of what that would be. If you were the best boyfriend or girlfriend you could be, or husband or wife or partner you could be, you have a sense of what that would be like. If you were the best parent you could be, you have a sense that you could be like that, but nobody can be perfect. So we fall short of our ideals, right? And that can cause consternation, worry, or anxiety, depending on how far apart you are from your self-ideal and your actual self, the thing you are every day, what you do. As a parent, there's times where you would like to think that you're really, you know, fair treating and egalitarian and calm and collected, and you have a bad day, and you wind up screaming at a kid who doesn't really deserve to be screamed at. And you're like, ah, at the end of it, if you're being honest about it, you say, maybe that was an overreaction on my part. So that makes me incongruent with the parent I'd like to be. Right? I'd like to be the more fair-minded, less overreactive parent, but you know, the reality is is sometimes I'm not as open-minded and overreactive. So I have this congruence, incongruence thing going on. So if I am honest with myself, I don't have to necessarily beat myself up about the disparity, but I would, as we'll see with cognitive dissonance, have to work towards being a better parent. Or skew my ideal self to something that is more in line with what is happening in reality. Self-esteem is something you definitely want to know for your test. And what I want you to be able to do is what most people can't do in the world. I want you to know the difference between self-efficacy and self-esteem. They are not the same thing. People hear those words and they're like, well, it's self something with E, right? They got to be the same. But it ain't the same. Self-efficacy is specific beliefs about your abilities to do things. Self-esteem is about your worth as an individual, your self-worth, what you think about yourself. And that is very different. They might be related in some ways. But what we see is conditions of worth. And again, here's a common thread. Growing up. We get feedback from our world. We look at the stages of development, whether we're talking about social stages of development, cognitive stages of development, moral stages of development. You remember Kohlberg's theories of moral development, I hope. And what you see there is a phone that won't shut off. Stop, phone. It's my alarm. There we go. Thank you, phone. Sorry about that. Try to stay on topic, right? Try to stay on track so I don't go too long and lead y'all astray from what you need to know. But you get feedback. Kohlberg's theory of moral development gives you feedback, right? What happens when the first stages? Punishment reward. That translates into whether somebody sees themselves as a good boy, good girl, bad boy, bad girl, right? And then you move up into social contract where you start understanding laws and authority, rules, and you either become anti-authority or pro-authority, you fall in line or somewhere probably in the middle, depending on the situation, right? Normal curve, normal distribution. And then you got a sense of who you are. Well, from Roger's point of view, your self-esteem starts when you're a little kid. What Mr. Rogers does on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood is reach out through the television to any little kid who's watching and affirms them. It says you're a good person, you have creativity, you have abilities, you should look to good things and, and feel good about yourself, right? It's very affirming. But that might not be what's happening in their actual world, right? Depending on the family environment they happen to be born into, they might get very good positive feedback talking about, oh, you're such a good kid, we love you so much, you're a wonderful child, and so on and so forth, all positive all the time, and they'd feel really good about who they are. But they might get born into a situation where, you little shit, I don't have time for this. You need to stop acting that way and quit being like that. Why don't you be more like your brother? He's better than you. And you get negative conditions of worth, right? Where you get a message over and over that you're not worthy, that you're not good, right? 
What happens over time is you see people internalize these ideas that they get from the outside that become inside concepts and they tend to be congruent. I watched, a, a, I don't know if I gave you this, this example before, but I watched, I talked to some parents in a soccer game years ago who said, oh, our little kid, he's just mean. He's mean as a snake. He throws things, he hits his brothers, he gets all pissed off all the time. And they're talking about this kid in really very concrete negative terms about how mean and bad he is. And then I saw the kid at a soccer game one time and he was over at the chain link fist going, I mean, just going off on the fence, and they're like, look, see how mean he is? And I'm like, why don't you stop him from doing that shit? Why don't you not go, you're so mean, you're so bad, you're always in trouble, and stop him from being mean and bad, and give him affirming. There's a difference here. People think this is just, oh, man, you give it to everybody a trophy for everything. That won't work. Because people know when they're being patronized, right? Kids know when they're being patronized. The idea here is you separate the worth of the human being from the behavior. The behavior may be totally unacceptable, but that's how we talk about it. We talk about it as the behavior. So I say, well, I love you, but that does not stand. You cannot do that. And if you do that, these are the consequences, right? That's the authoritative parent who's now laying out boundaries, laying out rules, giving explanations, and holding the boundaries. But at the same time, kids make mistakes. We all make mistakes. But when they screw up, they don't go, you're such a little shit, I can't believe you act like this all the time. They go, that behavior is not going to be acceptable. That behavior is going to be punished. That behavior is going to be modified versus you are a bad child. You are a bad kid. There's a very different message there, right? I can affirm the person and then disapprove of the behavior. And if I can do that, then what I'm going to do as a parent over time is create unconditional positive regard. I give complete emotional support and approval separating behavior from the person. It facilitates high self-esteem. Now you don't want false high self-esteem, that's just narcissism, right? You want people to feel good about who they are. If they feel good about who they are, they're more likely to succeed on a number of things in life. But you can't just give them, it's not permissiveness, it's not do whatever you want, you're always a good kid even if you do bad things, right? It's affirming the person. I told both my kids, I was like, you know what? You go to jail as adults, I'm not bailing you out. Unless I thought you were framed. In which case, if I think you're framed, honestly think you're framed, I'll bail you out. But if you go because you did something, then the consequence stands. And I'm not going to remove the consequence. Right? I'll come and visit you. I'll tell you I love you because I still care about you as a person, but the behavior has the consequences. But down the road, you know what? If you become a bank robber, I'm not taking responsibility for that. I did what I could as a parent, but you know what? If you become president of these United States, I'm not taking credit for that either, right? You did what you did because you made choices. The choices had consequences. They can lead down positive paths or they can lead down negative paths. But if a person feels better about who they are to begin with, and that's not an, an inflated sense of self-worth, but is one based in reality about being cared for, et cetera, independent of mistakes that we all make, then they're more likely to persevere through obstacles and challenges in life and succeed on their own terms. Because I don't know what terms of success are for other people. They have to be self-defined, right? I could say you should do this and you should do that, but it doesn't make it so. And it turns out that self-esteem is measurable. Self-efficacy is measurable. Unlike Oedipus complex, right? Unlike anal retentive personality and things like that, you could translate that into maybe a type A personality, but the way Freud expounded his theories, they didn't really lend themselves to measurement. But self-efficacy, I can measure my beliefs in whether I can do math or not. I can measure my beliefs in whether I can play basketball or not. I can measure my beliefs in whether I can quit smoking or not. And whether I feel good about myself or not, I can measure that too with reliability and validity. If you remember what we talked about with the intelligence tests, reliability, validity, and standardization and norms still apply. But what we see is when we got pre-teens, boys and girls feel pretty much equally good about themselves. Fascinating.
Once we enter the teens, what happens? Both plummet. But girls plummet far farther than, than guys plummet. And it stays roughly parallel. You get into your early 20s, go through your 30s, you may be raising a family, you may be engaged in a career, and you get this rise in self-esteem. Thinking about yourself, how good you are as a person. And what you see is females are always thinking less of themselves than males. And we get this peak when? At retirement age. You've been through all the shit life has to throw at you, right? You've been through it and you succeeded. And now you're sitting on top of the world, looking down. Men still higher. And then what happens? Health declines, right? Mortality starts getting salient. You start realizing how close the end is because you've lived a long time. And for the first time ever since grade school, you see that women actually have higher self-esteem than men. That's a sociological phenomenon. We can change it if you want to. Y'all have a great day.